When he, your dad passed, did you plummet into sadness? All my mom had was the information from her friends and this child psychologist, and it was 2001. So we went to a psychiatrist and that's when the medication started. Yeah, I was on six different medications for 15 years. In retrospect, had I been my parent with what I know now, I think the biggest thing that I needed was time. And I don't think anyone wanted to give me that because that wasn't what we did. And I'm 38 now, I'm still unraveling what happened. Did it ever occur to you like, I wonder if these drugs, do I need them? No, there was there, not one single thought. For me, the only thought that made sense was, again, I had been diagnosed by a doctor. Oh yeah. With the analogy that it's like, well, if you have diabetes, you take insulin. So I thought there was something biologically wrong with me. So it there was no point in questioning it. Well, this is, this is horrible, but it's the reality. Like, I knew I couldn't say anything to a mental health professional. Yeah, you would get a new would, diagnosis and... I would have been put on an involuntary psychiatric yeah. hold. I would have been carted off to the psych hospital 10 blocks down the road from me, given a new diagnosis and put on a whole bunch of new medications. And there was something deep in me intuitively that knew not to say anything. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Gabby Reese Show. I'm really excited about this week's guest because I feel like this is an important conversation. I'm going to be speaking with Brooke Seam. She is a professional chef for high-performing athletes in Major League Baseball, the NFL, and she's even a Food Network Chopped champion. But that's her day job because more importantly, her latest book, May Cause Side Effects, is a harrowing look at her experience as a 15-year-old being put on antidepressants and then at 30, figuring out, I want to get off these. What's the strategy? Why is it important? Because as of 2022, over 2 million U.S. teenagers take antidepressants, and that's every single day. So for me, not only is it important to talk about them being on the antidepressants, but what are we going to do to support them if they have to come off? So I'm excited to share with you my conversation with Brooke Seam. Let's get into it. Brooke, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for going out of your way. I'm so excited to be here. You are? Yeah. I love that. Hopefully we don't disappoint, right, Justin? <laughs> I like your confidence. <laughs> so if you were your parent of you when you were 15 uh -huh. and your dad passed away, mm -hmm. how did he pass? Was it unexpected? He had pancreatic cancer, but we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Or at least he didn't tell us. There's a little bit of... My mom and I aren't quite sure if he knew or not. I don't think a guy like that, a guy could keep it from two women, do you? Or was he good at that? You know, I don't, I don't know because I think I was enough of a child at that point that I wasn't really paying too much attention to the complex dynamics of my parents' life. Yeah. But we found a folder after he died of very oddly organized things that suggested that maybe he knew or even if he didn't consciously know he may have unconsciously known and yeah. he put you know passwords and all sorts of important information together into a folder that was very helpful after he died but as far as i knew as far as my mom knew he thought he had an ulcer oh yeah well it's interesting when people die how much easier it is when they are organized mm -hmm. i know it's a weird thing to say but laird's mom when she passed away was so organized and hers was a brain aneurysm she wasn't expecting this uh -huh. And I think about that. I'm half organized, so my kids would have some undoing to do. But wait, before you ask this question, can I make a slight non sequitur that I think you'll enter, you'll enjoy? Yeah. Uh, because my fa father died at the age I was 15. It was mm -hmm. just me, my mom, and my dad. Yeah. It very much changed my relationship with death instantly, right? Mm. And it made it a very open conversation between my mom and I. And my mom, <laughs> she called me on the way here. She's been on um, a uh, death cleaning spree for years now yeah it's swedish death cleaning it's a process where you start cleaning out your house and your stuff so your kids don't have to deal with it and she calls me and she says you'll be so proud of me i cleaned out two hangers a bobby pin somebody else's photo album and some old socks you're welcome and then she'll hang up the phone and this has been yeah like what we've been doing for the past couple of years where she's excited to death clean and apparently i won't have to deal with it that's a real thing. I gotta start thinking about that. She does it one. She says one thing a day. Really? Is the minimum. I have been having some AFib lately. I want to get into <laughs> it. 
Oh my gosh, Brody would hire somebody to do it. Uh, so if you were your parent when this happened. Okay. My mom, yeah. And when he, your dad passed, did you plummet into sadness? What happened that they sort of thought that it was the right idea, the right move? And this is a long time ago, so mm -hmm. there's obviously a lot more information out about how there isn't information about all of this. Yeah. Now, uh, knowing all that you know right now, and given what you were experiencing, what would you have done first okay. to so, help you? So the context is, and my mom and I recently had a long conversation about this, it's that there were multiple factors at work here. So I grew up, I was a very serious ballet dancer. So I had been trained from a very young age to smile through the pain. Be you're, stoic. Yeah, your feet are bleeding, doesn't matter. You have to smile and perform. So for me, there wasn't really any outward expression of grief or depression or anything. It was mostly just this stoicism combined with shock because it was so sudden. And so I think that made the adults around me kind of uncomfortable. They didn't know what to do with that. And so my mom, she's also grieving, right? It's also 2001, dial up internet. We don't quite have the research we have. So she starts talking to her friends, some of whom have degrees in psychology or social work or whatever. And she basically said, my kid is stoic and this is weird. What do I do? And that's when they suggested I go see a child psychologist. So, and that probably took three, four months before we even got to that point. So I think reasonably looking back, it wasn't an, you know, it wasn't an abnormal thing to do. Take your kid to the therapist. That's, I think, what a lot of parents are doing now. I mean, I hear parents taking their kids to preemptive therapy, which is a whole other problem we've created, but that's fun. Uh, but the thing was, is I was taken to someone under, one, I didn't like her, two, I didn't want to be there. So, mm. you so you weren't of, like even sharing? No, I wasn't talking to the child psychologist either mm. because I disliked her immediately. She broke my trust right away if I was even going to try. But it happened so fast that I was like, no, you're done. And then what happened was she, the child psychologist ended up calling my mother after maybe six, seven sessions and said that I can't tell you what's going on because of HIPAA, but I'm recommending a, uh, or I recommend you go see a psychiatrist instead of a psychologist because your kid needs medication. I'm, I'm, I'm diagnosing her with a depressive and anxiety disorder. You're wasting your money with me. And so at that point, I wasn't talking to my mom because I was 15. And all my mom had was the information from her friends and this child psychologist, and it was 2001. So we went to a psychiatrist and that's when the medication started. In retrospect, had I been my parent with what I know now, I think the biggest thing that I needed was time. And I don't think anyone wanted to give me that because that wasn't what we did. You know, I was studying for the SATs. It was about getting into college. None of that stuff went away. So there wasn't really a thought of maybe we take a break from school. Maybe mom and I take a trip together. Maybe we just wait it out for a year and see what happens. There was really nothing that any, any, any we just went back to normal. Because I don't think anyone knew what to do. Yeah. I didn't know what to do either. It's not anyone's fault. Yeah, these are the situations that we only go through once in our life. And it's the one we have no information on how to mm -hmm. get through. We're not going to go through it again. Mm -hmm. And by the time we really learn maybe the best practices, it's only because we did it through experience. And there's so much fear that is involved at the time that you're making decisions yeah. off of. And you run into the mistakes, by the way. I've yeah. done that as a parent myself, mm -hmm. where I, especially with one of my girls, we went through something and, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty measured person, but even within that, I had an outside person saying to me, oh, she could be potentially a threat to mm -hmm. herself. And that's all you have to hear as a parent. Yeah. And you're like, cool, whatever it is, let's go. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, the only reason I bring that up is because I think a lot of people go through things. Let's say um, people went through COVID and maybe a breakup and then they got fired or they quit their job or they're having a health thing. And then they're feeling sad. They're mm -hmm. feeling depressed. And so they think, well, I, the first thing is, and if you go to 
I mean, you were saying you got your medication from a GP, which I find fascinating. It started at a child psychiatrist right. and went into GPs. Yeah, which is wild. Yeah. But you know, you go, you talk to somebody three, four times and they're like, cool, no problem. We'll give you- <laughs> Try one time for 10 minutes. Is that it? I, yeah. So I guess the reason I, I start with that is because what I want to say to people is sometimes it feels like it's really urgent. Yeah. And it is urgent but it also doesn't mean you have to move so quickly. Mm -hmm. It means you can take your time, you can ask questions, you can do your homework, you can fire therapists. Mm -hmm. And so just to remind them, even though that urgency, because the urgency comes from, I gotta solve this. Yep. Like you said also, oh, my real life responsibilities were still there. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest thing that I think is even in parallel of feeling depressed or bad is that sometimes we have to be in that. Mm -hmm and it sucks. It's where the learning happens. Yeah, and sometimes that's the that's actually the best way through. And then maybe if you have some time, it's like, okay, maybe you need some assistance. Mm -hmm. This episode is brought to you by Maui Nui Venison. I first learned about Maui Nui Venison because it showed up to my house as a gift. And when I dove into what the company was doing and understood, I really fell in love with it. For starters, I'm always looking for high quality protein for myself and to give to my family, well, this checks the box. It's some of the most nutrient dense red meat on the market, but I wanna do it responsibly. And this, this brand is not mass market food. They are doing this in the most responsible way that you possibly can. And finally, it's so delicious. So it's not gamey and I can prepare it like I prepare all the other meats that I use in my house. And it's just something I can feel good about it. I share it with my friends. We even give some of the venison sticks to our participants at XPT because in 55 calories, they've got 10 grams of protein. So you know what I mean about nutrient dense and people really enjoy it. So maybe if you're on the fly and you don't have time, it's great for a snack. It's an, you know, sort of almost like a quick lunch. They have broths that I love. And I believe those have like 25 grams of protein in one of the containers. So they really do an incredible job and it will show up right to your door. So if you would like to secure your access to the best meat on the planet and help build a resilient ecosystem in Maui, you can head to MauiNuiVenison.com slash Gabby, and they will give you 15% off your first order when you use the code Gabby. So MauiNuiVenison.com slash Gabby, that's M A U I. N U I V E N I S O N dot com slash Gabby. And don't forget to use the code for your 15% off your first order. And this is a brand that my family uses, my friends use, and one that I'm really happy and excited to share with you. So you go on this journey, you're on these, this medic, these, what, like something I, in the book, it was like six to eight medications at one point. Yeah. I was on six different medications for 15 years. At one, at one really time. Change. How does yes. that work? Like, how do you take those medications? See, I, I haven't never taken medications. I'm so jealous. <laughs> well, no, I mean, listen. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, I just wish for me, this is <clears throat> the fact that I was medicated effectively without my consent when I was 15 mm -hmm. has irrevocably changed the course of my life. And I'm 38 now, I'm still unraveling what happened. And I don't know, and it like, it really bothers me a lot of the time. And it, you know, I kind of- When you say that, what know. do you mean? Like, it, you don't know, like, what is it that you think you're supposed to understand? So, you know, when, when we're talking, the, the primary medications that I was on was Effexor XR and Wilbutrin XL, which are two uh, antidepressants, SNRIs, and, they were not approved for use in children and teens when I was medicated in 2001, and they still aren't today, and yet people will still end up on them. I was on four different medications as that, that got piled on within about a year after starting those two antidepressants that at the time we thought was because of independent issues. It never dawned on anybody that maybe the fact that I had started taking these two drugs was causing physiological issues down the road. So when my thyroid started to go kind of wonky and I went to an endocrinologist, well, then they gave me Synthroid. And then I started randomly throwing up all the time. Like, I just throw a bile, wake up in the morning, throw a bile. That's weird. So then I got sent to a gastroenterologist and they did a colonoscopy and an endoscopy when I was 19, diagnosed me with bile reflux disease. And then I was on a big old pill called sucralfate, one gram, four times a day. 
And then I was put on birth control because what 15 year old who's not having sex isn't, right? I mean, it's just what they do, hmm. right? And then my skin was breaking out. And so they would put me on a variety of drugs for that and so on and so forth. But the thing was, is that again, all this started after I started taking the antidepressants, but nobody put it together. And I would even have been resistant to say that they were connected until I got off the antidepressants and then all of these problems magically went away. But I was left with a body that was pretty well wrecked. Um, for example, I've had postmenopausal hormone levels for, I've now had them tested for three, four years, and we can't seem to move them. And my hypothesis is, I don't know, I'm, like this is ane anecdotal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I was medicated at a time, like when you- In puberty. Right at the start of puberty. Mm. I think that wires or whatever weren't fully formed. And so my body, I just don't think developed under that, how it should have. And so now there are consequences of that. And that's a physical consequence. But there are also consequences, uh, for example, socially. And this was something that I thought was me until I started talking to more people who had been medicated as kids. And what I realized was that, again, I was medicated right on that line between childhood and young adulthood. So from 15 to, let's say, roughly 23, 24, going through college, that's when you're really kind of figuring out how to interact with the world, how to create adult relationships. And I mean that from every sense of the word, whether or not that's friendships, romantic relationships, work relationships, whatever it is. And the only way I can describe it is that it, it always sort of felt like I was kind of wrapped in cellophane, like a grocery store chicken or something. Yeah. And it was kind of like, I always had to work a little harder to get the message, see what I was trying to see, in connect mean, with even, people. I was gonna say even from them. So it yeah. was muted in both ways, in the receiving and in the, yes. in the, in the expressing. Right, for me, I feel like it was particularly muted in the receiving, mm. almost like it's like I understood the social cues, but it's like it didn't sink in. It's because I wasn't home. And so when my entire development as an adult, when I wasn't home, and then all of a sudden you get pulled off these drugs and go into withdrawal and have to completely, your life blows up. And then you're left with no tools to yeah, dig navigate yourself, the world. Dig yourself out of it. As basic as human connection and how to navigate a social situation, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it just kind of screws with you, especially because you're supposed to have that stuff figured out, you know, by the time you're 30 or 40 or whenever you decide to get off of them. But that that has been a very odd consequence of all this that, again, I would not have attributed to the situation until I started talking to other people who had gone through this. and all of a sudden all these like light bulbs went off in, in, in the room. Well, you, I, I've, you even discussed though that now that they're sort of realizing also sometimes if you're on these medications for a long time, that the brain, there is a sort of a shift or oh, a, a, a moving kind mm -hmm. of around of the brain. Yeah, which is documented. We know what happens yeah. there or at least one part of what happens neurologically. Is it just, do you think it's just easier I mean, listen. We don't. We, we're not. We don't need to go down the rabbit hole about the the money pit that is uh, prescription medication. Yeah. We. I think that's been really well established. Mm -hmm. And obviously, in the last two years, they're talking about SSRIs not even really working. I think Theo. That has been there all along. Yeah. You know, just. Yeah. But they just had to make some. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, my favorite was Theo Vaughn. Yeah. He's like, "What do you mean?" And like, I think he was talking to RFK Jr. <laughs> and he's like. I've been on those bitches for like 25 years, you know? What do you mean they don't work well? <laughs> yeah, it's like, but your microbiome gets, yeah, okay. Yep. So we're, here, but we're here because this is the thing about this. I do think we're in, technology for me has so many kind of downsides. We all, mm -hmm. you know, I think we understand what that is. The sleep, blue light, it goes on, the impulsiveness compared and our, our villages are too big. But the great thing is, is I also do think it's creating an information revolution. Mm -hmm. So people mm -hmm. like you, who you know write a book and can speak on this i think it's landing on a lot of places that we're realizing hey the system that maybe was set up originally maybe to help us it's a business mm -hmm. and and we've got to participate in in buying their products yep. so if you could go back at that time it would be give it some time maybe talk first to someone you trusted just get a second opinion 
that probably would have been <gasps> basic opinion. basic step two you know yeah but you, like you said your mom's grieving she was also grieving which i yeah. think is very difficult you can't you can't ignore that yeah. because she didn't have the person to bounce things off of anymore because yeah. she was suddenly a single parent yeah and also the time and place i mean it was reno nevada circa 2001 i'm honestly <laughs> not sure there was more than one child psychologist there that's right <laughs> She got kicked out all the other places. <laughs> <laughs> Probably ended up there. Uh, and I don't even remember her name. I mean, so there are some things that are just a little bit, you know, it was just a confluence of events. But a second opinion would have been huge. Or even a third opinion. I mean, I'm a big fan of, especially if the first one and the second one disagree, yeah. definitely go get a third. <laughs> yeah. I have a friend that always says, um, you know, it reminds, because he walked his mom through a long cancer, fight with cancer. Um, she eventually passed away but he says listen they work for you you can fire them yeah and you can ask for new ones and i think we get so we don't want to bother them i don't want to take too much time with questions mm -hmm. i think it's really important for people when you're talking about serious things like your health in any way physical or mental that you can you can ask yeah. questions and you can fire your doctor yep it's okay absolutely i highly recommend it <laughs> i highly recommend cheating on your doctor too <laughs> Good. Oh, that's a one-time legal cheat. I yeah. like it. Yeah. There you go. We'll see two people. See what happens. <laughs> so you go to college, and is in the beginning, you know, at 15, 16, is there, an, is there a buoyancy to your mood internally? Was your internal climate improved by these medications ever? And so I have a little trouble answering that question because one of the side effects of these drugs and also a known side effect of, you know, PTSD and suddenly losing someone like that the way I did is memory loss. Mm. So I have a, uh, my memory was deeply affected by these drugs. I know that for sure. Again, this is one of those things that as soon as they were out of my system, all of a sudden I was remembering conversations I had yesterday. So I, but I, I had a lot of memory loss about what's interesting is that it's about a two year span on either side. So pretty much from roughly 13 to 19 mm -hmm. if things are real fuzzy and so i don't specifically remember feeling any better i asked my mom one time i was like did you did you think they helped and she was just kind of like honestly they probably helped me more than they helped you because yeah. she felt like she had some support and now she would say that she did it completely out of fear so that she medicated me for her yeah. which i think is the real honest reason why 99 percent of parents medicate their kids and that's not to shame the parents but it's just to say that we really need to remember who we're helping here mm -hmm. and so well, i don't think there was any market difference i mean there were definitely side effects uh like physical ones yeah you know and hence the four other drugs i ended up on but i never went down a road of teen pregnancy or drugs or truancy or anything like that but the thing is i was never at risk for that like i didn't go from a straight a student to yeah. hanging out behind a trash can and that's why i was put on drugs i like i think my grades slipped from like an a to maybe a b plus in one class and yeah. that was the fear yeah. like that was the oh my god we got to stop this before something well, they, horrible happens it sounds like they use it as a prophylactic Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, like we're going to protect her from uh, any feelings that might be coming down the pipe or ones that we, we're not aware of. Well, what they do or what they did for me is they, they couch it in this, they couch it in this, this is going to help you through it narrative. But there's also this subtle subtext that says you are not capable of getting through a very basic human experience on your own. And then when they start throwing labels on it, whether or not it's depression and anxiety or whatever else they want to throw on it, out of, as a 15 year old, you fully come to identify with that for every reason, not just because, not just because you're, you are in some level of pain and it's an explanation for it, but then, you know, there's also, it makes you feel like you belong to something mm. and it makes you feel like it, it's not your fault. And I mean, no, it wasn't my fault that my dad died. It wasn't my fault that I was depressed, but it was my responsibility, even at 15, to experience that and start to coexist with that in a way that wasn't going to be destructive to myself or other people. It was shit luck that I had to figure that out at 15 rather than 40 or 50 or 60, like most people do when their parents die. But yeah. it is what it was.
This podcast is brought to you by Bond Charge. I've been using my Bond Charge red light face mask for about six months and I'm really loving it. First of all, easy to use. It's at home. I don't have to go anywhere. It takes 10 to 20 minutes a day. Red light has been known to boost collagen, help with fine lines and wrinkles, even blemishes and acne. So it's good for if you're a little older, if you're a little younger. For me, I want you to do all the things. I want you to move your body. I want you to eat well and want you to rest. But these are the nice little things that can boost. Hey, I, I feel like it is supporting my skin and feel good, look good. Those definitely go part and parcel. And they have an incredible offer for you if you've been curious about this red light face mask. So here's how the offer goes. You can order the Bond Charge red light face mask today with this great Black Friday, Cyber Monday deal. So if you want to get it for yourself or think about it, it's the holidays, get ahead of it. It would make an incredible gift. You will get 25% off plus free shipping on the red light face mask. All you have to do is go to bondcharge.com and use my exclusive code Gabby25 at checkout. So that's bondcharge.com. And don't forget the promo code Gabby25 for 25% off your red light face mask. It's cordless, 10 to 20 minutes. You can do it at your desk. I have a friend, she does it before bed. All you have to do is head to bondcharge.com, B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E.com. And don't forget to use Gabby, G-A-B-B-Y, 25 for your savings. Yeah, and, and also just to note, and I'm sure you know this, that age pocket is one of the hardest times to lose a parent or go mm -hmm. through a divorce. Yep. People think, oh, younger. It's in, like I lost my father at five, way easier. Yeah. It's when you're in this transition mm -hmm. that a divorce or a death is actually the hardest yep. because the world as you know it, which is already changing, yep. has gotten flipped up, upside down. So it's it's very oh hard. God. So you go to college and did you were you always interested in being a chef? No. Well, what I don't know. There was, there's, there, again, it's just that there's so much apathy that comes with these drugs. Like, your mm. life becomes a series of the path of least resistance. And so you make choices based on what feels easy, not by what feels right or not by intuition, because again, you're not fully home, or at least I wasn't, you know, everything I say is my experience, but yeah. I hear this from other people as well. And so I ended up going to culinary school after I got went to undergrad at Middlebury College, which is a, you know, true, true liberal arts school. And, but I was so not home during that time. I think I had seven or eight different majors because I didn't know what I wanted to do. More importantly, I didn't have the drive to want anything. Mm -hmm. So I was just trying to find something and then and graduate. So I, I successfully did that. And then I remember I was sitting with my mom in a coffee shop or something. And I just looked at her and I was like, literally tell me what to do, I don't know. And she said, well, the only thing you've had a consistent interest in your whole life has been food. Everything else you've done for a while and then it kind of, you know, falls away. And I said, okay, well, I guess I'll move to New York and go to culinary school. Like it was just the most blasé choice. I had no emotional connection to it, but I hadn't had an emotional connection to anything in six years. So it felt so normal to me. Did you have a heartbreak or anything like that in college? Like a breakup where you, um, you know, where you were weepy or any of that? I don't, ooh, I don't, rem I mean, I did have a breakup, but I don't remember being devastated by it. Hmm. Uh, what, what it, what the sense is that to me, I was very, I felt like the, really the only range of emotions I could feel for the majority of time I was medicated was boredom or indignancy. That was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And However, it's not like there wasn't a full collection of things that happened to me during the 15 years I was medicated. So then when I finally got off those drugs, it was like it all came back at once. And the, the, I, my, my college boyfriend actually had died, not while we were together, but like shortly after. Yeah. It's like I didn't even register that until the drugs were out. And that's when I had to go through all the grief around him. And then that's when I had to go through all the grief around my father and yeah. all the other things that had happened. And so that's when the, the real colorful uh, spectrum of emotion came into place was after all these mm. things had happened significantly because I couldn't feel it. So that's when all the weepiness happened. And now it's just like, that's just a Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <It's laughs> I think that, I think for us, it's once a month, right? Um, so <laughs> be, I feel like that would be a reprieve at this point, but. <laughs> Tears are healthy. Mm -hmm. So you, 
you become you start i mean you're you're doing all kinds of work you're on chopped you're what did do that did you enjoy it so i was on chopped uh no not chopped oh, like oh. just c cooking, cooking and cooking for oh. people like was God, it fun no. was it creative no. it's horrible i was getting paid 70 seven dollars an hour to get yelled at yeah. in dark, you know, basement but it was again it was the path of, path of least resistance because mm -hmm. all also the financial crisis had occurred right when i started working in kitchens so you know any plans of going going to get a job at goldman sachs like my other new england friends had done just was out the window so i was pretty much in the industry i had this sense of if you can't make new york work for you then everywhere else isn't going to work because it's in new york right mm. so i sort of talked myself into a story of the only shot I have at success and happiness is by being in the center of everything. So I'm just gonna stay here and be miserable, which is a paradox that I lived for eight years. And you know, there were some moments of ambition or maybe a little bit of creativity, but again, everything was just extremely muted. Everything was the path of least resistance. I never stopped to ask if my life was good for me or right for me because I always had this storyline to fall back on that was, well, like, it doesn't matter where you are because you're depressed and it's your brain chemistry and there's nothing you can do. And basically your job is to just get through it until you either don't want to anymore or you get hit by a bus. Like that was it. Yeah. That was, there was, there was no light, no joy. It was just trudging. Did you have an exercise? I know you're a dancer. Did you maintain an exercise practice of any kind when you were an adult? Well, I, when I was working really long hours in kitchens where it was like a 6 a.m. Mm. type of thing, then it was mostly just standing and that life was not at all particularly uh, healthy in any way. But when I opened my bakery, mm -hmm. I, I co-owned a bakery in New York, I, I realized I just couldn't stand around and eat cake all day. So I started getting into CrossFit at that point and Olympic weightlifting and that, that at least made me, it gave me at least some community and a little bit of a foundation and something to do that hurt a lot you know mm -hmm. conscious suffering mm -hmm. so I, I did start that that has served me well as life had gone by but th that didn't start till i was about 27. and is it is it a secret when you're an adult that uh you're you're taking medication is that like your own private experience or is it something that's really kind of talked about with friends or people that you know like I, what is that like I think this has changed because the amount of people who are on these drugs now is Oh, I wrote increasing. it down. Wait, so for people, uh, let me see, where did I put this? Okay, so in 2013, 32.7, uh, and this is United States, by mm -hmm. the way, so 32.7 million, and then it went up to 37.3 in 2018, which means 240 million uh, prescriptions yeah. in 2018 um which is the last time we have yes big census data on and it stuff. increased 35 percent in six years yeah so that was i thought really mm -hmm. it's worse now well because covid has kicked everyone's ass and the being telemarketing or not telemarketing tele oh telemedicine yeah. and all that because it's so easy it's so easy now okay so was it so is it something that you go like your friends and or you know whoever boyfriend at the time is it like hey this is something i'm doing or is this like sort of your own private experience and they go god brooke is a really even killed girl like what does that look like i don't think they ever <laughs> said i was even killed i think that there was it was pretty clear that there was i really leaned heavy on sarcasm and which i now know is is such a defense mechanism mm -hmm. but i think they they knew that i don't know i just wasn't very happy and i don't think that was a secret but i didn't share too much about the different drugs i was more open talking about all the physical things and all the drugs for the physical stuff than i was the antidepressants mm -hmm. but i do remember i had there was a few times where someone would come to me kind of in private and you know they would talk about an experience they had with a psychiatrist and ask me my opinion some really close friends who had known mm -hmm. what was going on and then but it was it was so hush hush mm. because i we hadn't quite hit into the peak anti-stigma stuff yet that has now you know like everything else just gone way too far and uh so i didn't talk about it too much and i especially didn't talk about it in high school college all of that i don't know if i felt shame i just felt other yeah so i just didn't say much yeah because again i was like a kid so it was so normal to me 
it's such a private though it's such an interesting thing that nothing in our life i mean obviously there's private there's sort of certain things that are for us only but i think something like that it would just be interesting where I be, like, let's say you had a friend who did a lots of yoga, mm-hmm. some touchy feely friend, I don't know, right, yeah. who's like leaning on you, like, what do you feel? What do you feel? You know, I don't know. Like, you never had someone really try to get into your bubble, and and then somehow it made you think about, you know, is is this my personality or what is this? Like, did you ever get? Did you ever have these like kind of private thoughts with yourself like huh I wonder because I get it that it was so early Mm -hmm. so it was just a part of your life but as you got older and I know you had sort of a a, actually a very kind of monumental day cathartic experience but before that did it ever you're in the shower did it ever occur to you like huh like I wonder if these drugs do I need them what are they really doing for me or it was just as usual no there was not one single thought because Mm. for me the only thought that made sense was again i had been diagnosed by a doctor oh yeah <laughs> at a with, with with the with the analogy that it's like well if you have diabetes you take insulin which everyone gets that analogy and so i thought there was something biologically wrong with me mm. so it there was no point in questioning it and None of my doctors questioned it, so why would I? I was just the patient. What did I know? And so my only thought was, if I stop taking these, it's just going to be worse because they're an antidepressant. It's in the name. So I was just absolutely mesmerized and spellbound by all the marketing. And it never, ever, ever dawned on me. It never dawned on anyone else. The only person who asked questions about it was my mom. The whole time she would say, like, you think something needs to be changed? Or she would just kind of gently Mm -hmm. try and nudge the door open. And I would shut her down over and over again, saying, you don't understand. I didn't choose this. I can't just turn it on and off. It's a disease. I mean, everything you can imagine as far as the way people yell at me now on the Internet is yeah was my response to her (laughs) yeah. Well, and you're smart, too, so you can word salad it, I'm sure, pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're. In, walking on the street one day and you kind of have a I guess a, a kind of come to, to come to <laughs> Jesus in my apartment. moment yeah <laughs> but what was it I what was I read the story about like though something about the rain and uh oh that was during withdrawal oh sorry yeah that was yeah. not the catalyst okay so let's talk yeah. about your your reason for saying okay maybe this isn't working and I'm going to yeah. get off all this and mm-hmm. then the big surprise big surprise yeah. So I was 30 years old and it was, I was about to turn 30, which is, you know, you contemplate things on those big birthdays and it felt like a very big deal. And I was kind of obsessed with, with quantifying things I didn't understand. So I would count things. Like if I was bored, if I was a passenger in a car and I was bored, like I was in a taxi or something, I would count the number of cars that past us. I just played these little minds games myself. And so one day I was at home in my apartment about to turn 30 and I calculated the number of days that I'd been alive. Cause I was just curious. <laughs> and then I calculated the number of days since my dad had died. And then I realized that because I was 15, I was about to pass this you know, precipice mm-hmm. of, I was about to be alive more days without him than I had with him. That was a very sobering, odd thought, which immediately was followed by, wait a second, if that's the case, then it also means I'm about to have spent more of my life on psychiatric drugs than off of them, which just made me uncomfortable. I didn't really do anything with that thought right away, but that just, that's, that, that it, it planted a seed. And what was also going on at that time is I was... I was having a ton of suicidal uh, thoughts and ideation, but it was not an active crisis. Like, and I think that that's one thing people really miss about the nuance of that conversation is that there are some people who are very chatty about it. Let's say they're active. They're they're in some sort of what's called emotional dysregulation or whatever word we want to put on it, where it makes it clear to other people or even to themselves that they are in an active crisis. There's another aspect of that, which is that's quiet. It's insidious. It's just something that's on your mind all the time. 
And for me, it never felt like a crisis and never dawned on me to call the suicide hotline because it was something that I had lived with for so long about this just didn't want to be alive. And it was just getting more and more pervasive, that feeling. And I was losing le more and more gumption to get up and do my life. Is it the boredom and the fuzz between yeah. you and the whole world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just like, it just became, it was feeling more and more pointless, more and more, why? Mm -hmm. I mean, but it yeah. was just this absolute blase, nothing's worse it nothing's worth it uh you know the t the literature will call it more of like emotional blunting tardive dysphoria all of these things that are connected with long-term use of antidepressants and so i had again i was calculating things i had i lived on the 30th floor and i had taken to staring out my window and like i pushed the screen out and then i calculated the amount of time it would take to hit the ground and this did not alarm me and so i say that just because sometimes that the way this comes up on people is slow. Like, and there was just nothing alarming about it to me. It wasn't alarming to me that I knew how long it would take to hit the ground, but then it dawned on me, wait a second, I shouldn't be this depressed if the antidepressants are working. That was the light bulb moment that took 15 years to get mm -hmm. there. That ended up getting combined with this very, very odd lottery thing I sort of won. I got an opportunity to travel around the world for a year and I had, drunkenly applied and it was not something that my life was set up to do but it was i had nothing to lose i was in a very big state of fuck it so i had applied months before forgot about it it's also why i ended up on chop because i was just like fuck it who cares <laughs> and uh so i ended up getting that opportunity and i realized lo logistically i couldn't take these drugs in a suitcase with me it just literally could not take oh, a year's worth in a suitcase and so i kind of said okay well that combined with this like you know, probably shouldn't want to jump out my window if the drugs were working. Let's go see a psychiatrist. And that's when she pulled me off the drugs. And that's when I went into withdrawal. And that's well, because she pulled you off my life cold turkey and said, we don't know. And you might feel fluey, mm -hmm. but there's it a, went on for months. Well, there's, uh, over a year. There's yeah. a caveat here in the cold turkey thing, because I think most people know in, in you know, the PSA don't stop any of your drugs without consulting a doctor or any of those things. I knew that. Mm -hmm. I was smart enough to know that. But the thing was is that I was on the lowest dose of one of my drugs on the market. I was on 37.5 milligrams of Effexor XR. So in 2016, according to my psychiatrist, there wasn't anything she could do other than to tell me to stop taking it. I now know that this was wrong then, and it's certainly not the right strategy now. And there's a lot more information about how we can safely taper off these drugs, even when you're on the lowest dose on the market. How, what does that look like? Well, it, it involves multiple multiple strategies. Uh, the first is, so what's most commonly done right now is what's called a linear taper. So let's use 100 milligrams of anything as a mm -hmm. easy easy way to math. So typically, let's say you're on 100 milligrams of Prozac, or whatever the drug is, you'll go to your doctor, you'll say, I want to get off of it. They'll say, okay, well, take 50 for a few days or maybe a couple weeks and take 25 and then go to zero. Uh, they will very often just step you down based on what's available on the market. Sometimes they will say, you can't do this with all drugs. This is also really important. People go and try and do this on their own and then they get screwed because they don't understand how the time releases work in different different drugs, some of them are designed to release slowly. If you cut them in half, you'll screw up the time release and mm. then you go into withdrawal or you have, you're getting too much of the drug in your system it can cause a whole bunch of problems. So blindly cutting things off in half isn't the solution, but sometimes you have a capsule, can't cut that in half. Well, mm. then sometimes people are literally opening their capsules up and counting the beads inside. But what's more, uh, more of the common, well, in the past couple of years, we've had some actual research on this, and what's come out is something that, that is called more of a hyperbolic taper. Mm -hmm. So that's a looks like a curve as opposed to a line, and that's roughly a 10% reduction every two to three weeks, which is extremely slow if you're on 150 milligrams of three different drugs, which so many people are. But it seems to have a better likelihood of not plunging you into withdrawal so bad you get a book deal out of it, like I did. Right. Uh, <laughs> and people can kind of sl uh, speed up and slow down based on how their body's handling things. But the, the thing is, it just requires a practitioner or a coach or someone on your side who is withdrawal informed and understands that if you start having a variety of symptoms that can look anything like 
a major gastrointestinal disorder to another diagnosable psychiatric disorder, yeah. they know that that is because you're withdrawing, not because you're suddenly bipolar, like magically out of nowhere. That's not, you know, it's because you're coming off a very powerful drug. And not enough people know that. Not enough coaches know that. Not enough doctors know it for sure. Not enough psychiatrists know, know it. And a lot of them will fight us when we try to talk about this. So, and what does that look like? They'll fight you. Oh, it's so funny when you poke the system and all their <laughs> so education and all their education. It's very interesting. It's like here's more education. Why yeah. is this a problem? I'm confused. Yeah. Well, because also when they went to school, we weren't all as medicated, and now that we're here, oh. what does it look like? Yeah. So, what what are some of the things that they throw at you if you even talk about um, this uh, hyperbolic uh, curve? The biggest one well the hyperbolic curve in, in itself i think is becoming more and more accepted which is really good mm. uh the thing that the hyperbolic curve requires which not everywhere has is when you have to have a withdrawal informed or a taper informed practitioner mm. clinician you usually have to have a compound pharmacy mm -hmm. which can be financially prohibitive or sometimes it doesn't even exist in a place that you know smaller towns tend to not have one but the compound pharmacy allows for you to make dosages that fit the hyperbolic curve that are less than 37.5 milligrams. So had it been me, we should have cut it down by roughly three, four grams. So I would have been at 29 grams of a flexor and hanging out there, which mm -hmm. may have come in a, a capsule form or it may have come in a liquid suspension all the way down to zero. And it gets smaller and smaller by the microgram as you get closer to zero. So it gets extremely tedious. Uh, but if people don't have a compound pharmacy available to them, then they are literally at home being their own drug lords with drug scales, razor blades, counting beads. But even the blade, like even counting the beads will have different strengths. So there are some people who are so sensitive that one bead on one day could screw them up, but on the next day it won't because they're so sensitive to that small amount of change. Hmm. And based on their own chemistry and, and uh, everything else. So yeah. When you leave the office and she goes, okay, we're gonna pull you off that. Yeah. Uh, were you going off all of the mental mm -hmm. medications? At the time when I first went in there, I said, I said to her, look, this is the situation. I've been on these for 15 years. I have this up, I need to, I'm gonna get on a one way trip to Malaysia in six months. Like <laughs> something needs to Good change. Good planning. Oh, Good yeah. job, you're ahead, I like it. <laughs> I thought I had plenty of time. And I also thought that I just needed a different drug. I was under the impression that there had been some sort of major scientific advancement in 15 years and that there was a better drug that I just needed to be on and that these weren't working anymore. So the plan was just to get off the Effexor and the Wellbutrin long enough to hit a baseline mm -hmm. and then take whatever new wonder drug was on the market. But I fundamentally didn't understand, one, that just because the drug is out of your blood doesn't mean it's fully titrated out of your brain, which is what the hyperbolic curve is based on. It's based on PET scans where they're measuring something called CERT occupancy, which is serotonin occupancy, and it doesn't line up with half-lives and the, the amount of the drug in your blood. So this is why the hyperbolic curve is required and why there's such a problem with the linear tapering method, because for example, I believe, let's see, with venlafaxine, I think at roughly 37.5, really pulling there's i can see it in my brain it's close enough here but at about 37.5 milligrams which is the lowest on the market you still have around a 70 percent start occupancy so mm. when you go from 70 to zero your body just goes haywire and that's what withdrawal is and so the only way to slowly make that gently come down you know the difference between walking out of the seventh story floor window and walking out on the ground floor is very 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 careful slow tapering to match the cert occupancy in the brain. But that research didn't really come out until roughly 2021. So I've completely gone off track so wait, the original so, question. <laughs> no, so you have six months to your, your yeah, trip. Right, right, but I thought, because my doctor, she just says to me, yeah, you'll feel like you have the flu for a, a couple of weeks. Mm. And then I thought I would hit whatever my true baseline was. And I'd be able to assess, do I need them? Do I not? Maybe we try something else. We'll be able to figure this all out Before in six months, no problem. I need to be on the all the thyroid and all that all the other four drugs. I thought that those were like things that I just had to deal with chronically for the rest of my life. Do you? I'm just curious because I was raised very differently. Um, 
and I'm so curious about when people, we do things because we're told to and we accept it as is. Mm -hmm. It's like even when someone's like, I have a headache, I take an aspirin. Part of me is like, why do you have a headache? Right, it's not an aspirin deficiency. Right, so it's always, I'm, I'm always curious was the thinking that you just never thought about it, that you were on all these other medicines and it was just like, well, I do what the doctors tell me to do. And no. was there ever a thought about your overall health? Yeah. Did it? Did you ever can think in your mind or care? Mm -hmm. And I know you had already sort of this, you know, a little bit disconnected emotional reaction to things. Mm -hmm. That Did it ever in your psyche kind of go, hey, maybe these things aren't good for me, for mm -hmm. my my own sort of constitution and and uh, just just my body. I would say that there was a Venn diagram happening, and there were three things on that Venn diagram. The first thing was that again, remember I was a very serious dancer. I was trained to listen to other people, to tell me about my body, to fix it, to do it in whatever their vision was, to do it without complaining to do it instantly and to not question it so that and to people please them at the same time because if i didn't then i wouldn't get the part i wanted yeah so there was that then there was this also um there was this sense of like i was i really wasn't raised to question anything and it wasn't my, because honestly, my dad was the one who really bucked society a lot. I that was had, his job in the house. Yeah, I think had he stayed alive, there would have been a lot more, you know, underhanded comments or just, just bullshit and then yeah. walk out of the room. But my mom isn't like that. She's, she just isn't like that. And so I, I definitely didn't have that instinct. And then as far as health goes, I, I take full responsibility around the idea that a part of me liked being sick because it was beneficial. Yeah. I liked the attention I got if I was sick. I liked feeling different. I liked being a part of something in kind of a, you know, sick, twisted way. Yeah. I liked that it was an excuse. I liked that I didn't have to take responsibility for anything. It's a very immature way of thinking that being in withdrawal got me out of real quick because it was so bad that I didn't like it anymore. But everything was just, you know, I was able to just be that self-indulgent and in a way that absolutely drove myself further down into a hole. But when you combine it with the fact that I wasn't really raised to question things too much and also with the fact that I was busy trying to please everyone around me by having the perfect body and not you know, arguing and doing things my body wasn't supposed to do. It just kind of meant that my health was irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, but because I was obsessed with food on the full spectrum, like both from being a chef and also, again, ballet dancer. Dancing. I was, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was very aware of food and how it could affect my body mm -hmm. positively and negatively, which has ended up being a huge part of my recovery and healing as time went on. But that was the only thing that I was kind of dialed into in the sense of like, you know, I knew that eating donuts wasn't good for me and I would, you know, go eat an avocado, but it didn't dawn on me that anything else I was putting in on or surrounding myself with had anything to do with health. That came way later. Yeah, in a big way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it feels like you're uh, making up for all the lost time. Yeah, um, it's very, very lost. <laughs> <laughs> you're out there with the the flamethrower. Um, you know, it's, I think all the things you said are not unique. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really appreciate you verbalizing that because living, even when it's good, and even when you can, you have the tools, there are days that you go, I would like an excuse mm -hmm. and uh, I don't want to figure it out and I don't want to, uh, you know, do my best and wake up. And yeah. so I, I, I think a, it, it's really a human feeling Absolutely. and uh, I, re I, I really appreciate that. So she takes you off, you go to your apartment. Right. And then about six days later, we're taking a walk and it starts raining. And that was where. Wait, by really the way, changed. New York is the worst place to be. Can you imagine like <laughs> you're disgusting. in withdrawals <laughs> from an antidepressant and you're in New York? Oh my God. It was horrible. I mean, the and, noise, the uh -huh. light, the, yeah. the just how loud it is. 
Yeah. I mean, so the, what? Ha- what's exactly happening? What you, you t- you're taking a walk. So, so the strategy, if we can say that we had one, was <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good luck. Uh, well, she did say that. Was she said go off the effects are first because the withdrawal effects are likely to be. She still told me I would just have the flu, but she was like, if you're gonna have withdrawal effects, it's likely to be more intense because Effexor has a short half life. So. Again, this this this, this science is pretty, is not pretty, is wrong. Like it has nothing to do with the half life of the drug. I mean, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. But it does make the withdrawal effects come on quickly. It's just that the the mis the miscommunication there is that when the drug is out of your system and if it has a short half life, you think to yourself, well, I should only experience these withdrawal symptoms during the period of the drug is coming out of my system, not for a year after. That was the miscommunication the, the, around, around half-life. And they didn't do that part of the study? No, because why oh. would they? They're only six to eight weeks, and they've never studied withdrawal anyway. But so with the effects are, I, uh, I, I caught the flu for the first few days like she thought. It was jittery. I felt like I'd had a lot of coffee, which I had experienced before because I had you know missed a dose here and there or I couldn't get it filled or something. So I was sort of familiar with the first couple of days, and I thought that that was sort of what it was. But then what happened was... A few days in, I was walking in New York, and everything you just said kind of hit me all at once. I sort of mentioned feeling like a chicken in cellophane, and it sort of felt like the the cellophane came off me in one moment, because it was about April or late March, and it started to rain, and I was in New York. I was on about 36th Street and Park, and what surprised me is that I was walking on the street like I always did, and my vision changed. So... You know how when you look at headlights at dusk and they kind of glow? Mm -hmm. And for me, they had always looked like orbs. And then in this one moment, all of a sudden, they looked like stars. And everything around me just completely focused and sharpened. And I looked up and there was one of those big snake lamps Mm -hmm. hanging over the street. And all of a sudden, I could see the inner workings of the light bulb. And I could see the stars coming out from the light. And... At the same time, so this was a full sensory experience that happened all at once, it started to rain. And so my hearing like clicked on and I started to just notice all the whooshes of umbrellas opening around me and the sounds and it just got very loud. And then also I started to notice the rain hitting my skin and what had just felt like rain before. I mean, it's a very bizarre thing to say, but it felt like it went from just feeling like I had water on me to like little bullets hitting my arm. Like it was mm-hmm. felt almost like hail, but it was rain. And it hurt, like it actively hurt. And I was just kind of standing there like this. I mean, it was New York, nobody gave a shit. Just standing there. And I just kind of said, oh my God, something's about, like something big is about to happen. And- Were I, you scared or were you excited? I was baffled mm-hmm. because I had been under the impression, and this, this speaks to some of the questions you asked earlier, I had been under the impression that these drugs were only affecting my mind. And I had just been informed that they were affecting my entire system. And so the thought that came to me next was something along the lines of, if these are changing how, like literally how I see, what else has been affected? And that's where everything opened up to a world of, it was very uncomfortable because it was just this realization that I had made every single choice and spent my entire adult life under the influence of incredibly powerful drugs. And I didn't know if I would have made those same choices without those drugs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to jump out my window. So that was a real hard thing to start unraveling. And then the really severe withdrawal effects hit. And so then I was in that too. Yeah. And what do you do? Are you in your apartment? Like, are you just white knuckling it? Do you get any forms of relief? How do you find ways to to get through that? Well, after I was in the rain, I remember walking home and I don't quite remember exactly, like, it was a matter of days or hours. I mean, everything was really jumbled time-wise for me at that time, but the the physical once the cellophane came off of me it's like all the withdrawal effects came in quickly and so i had all the physical effects which were from a sensory standpoint everything was just so hypersensitive that like it was literally difficult for me to walk outside Mm -hmm. because it was so 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 loud Mm -hmm. and lights right i couldn't watch tv because it was too 
the lights of the television were too much. I stopped sleeping, so then I was up at night and I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't listen to music because it was, it, especially um, anything remotely negative was horrible for me to listen to. I could sort of listen to maybe some like nice nature sounds or mm -hmm. some really calm <laughs> classical music, but anything that had any sort of angst or aggression to it was, it was just completely grating. And then my skin started uh, freaking out. I developed something called nodular vasculitis, mm -hmm. which is an immune response. And basically I had all these bumps underneath my skin that were really painful and it made it so I didn't want to wear clothes. And uh, then my gut was going crazy and I was just agitated. So those are the physical effects, but then you had to layer on the psychological effects. So the uh, effects are in particular, I started having these really horribly violent intrusive thoughts and they were triggered by seeing other people's faces, which again, being in New York City was a problem because every time I went out into the street, it was just coming at me. And I would just sort of, it was sort of like, it was like my mind's eye was really active in the way that you can kind of create a movie in your head, but it was just these horrible, horrible, violent things towards myself and other people. And I did know enough at this point to, well, this, is, this is horrible, but it's the reality, like, I knew I couldn't say anything to a mental health professional. Yeah, you would if, get a new would, diagnosis and... I would have been put on an involuntary psychiatric yeah. hold. I would have been carted off to the psych hospital 10 blocks down the road from me, given a new diagnosis and put on a whole bunch of new medications. And there was something deep in me intuitively that knew not to say anything. So that was also very isolating because I wasn't, I was, I was extremely scared because what I thought at that point was that, oh, I'm actually crazy. Like this is what these drugs have been hiding this whole time. Right. So he, here I am feeling like, okay, it has been, in, I've been informed that you're actually crazy. You can't say anything about it. But also, also I was having these little, like very, very brief moments because at least for me and the way my withdrawal went is that it was sort of just like this universal expansion and so for as horrible and dark things as things were there were these teeny tiny little moments of this of of what i would just call these glimmers that were these little like moments of light and they were wildly unbalanced it was like one second of a little glimmer and then yeah. two weeks of hell i mean yeah. it was completely unbalanced but what did the glimmers tell you they told me it was just i was fascinated by them because like i said when my when my vision changed color changed so the world suddenly became more colorful to me it's like when you put this saturation slider up on instagram and i remember i was looking at a flower i think it was some fuchsia colored flower and i was just kind of obsessed with it and enthralled by it because i had never noticed that color before mm -hmm. and that in itself i was so angry because like in that little moment i could see beauty just like a glimmer of it and i hadn't felt or seen that in 15 years and it, just the idea that this drug that i didn't make a choice to go on had taken away my ability to see and experience beauty pissed me off and i was so angry that it sort of trumped it trumped how horrible everything was in part because i was naive to how long it was going to last if you had told me it was going to last a year i might have not have had the fortitude yeah but i was still under the impression that i just had to put up with this for like a couple weeks yeah and you had the trip you're getting ready for the trip yeah, everything thank god was, everything was gonna be fine you're going to malaysia then. let's go it wasn't fine <laughs> it wasn't fine <laughs> but the the color thing was really the first thing i noticed that sort of kept me going and then the next one was a cup of coffee and it was just the smell of the coffee again it was like i'd smelled coffee for the first time and I was just baffled by that, how I could have never noticed that. And so that was just enough to give me a little handhold to say like, okay, well, like, what else, what else is out there? What could be mm -hmm. a life uh, for me? Maybe if, if I can just see more flowers and smell more coffee. So it was just these little tiny handholds coupled with the extreme anger and stubbornness. And I was just pissed. So I wasn't going to go anywhere near them again and then i think having the this bizarre opportunity and the amount of logistics i had to put into place in order to just abandon my life for a year because i had a dog i had a brick and mortar business i mean there was nothing i there was nothing that was set up for this so there was enough things for me to kind of say like okay i have to figure out passports and visas mm -hmm. and 
how do you pack for a year in four different climates? And, you know, when are the fights going to happen? And who's going to take my apartment? And where's the dog going to go? And there was just so much going on, also chopped, that I, <laughs> I was able to at least wake up in the morning and have a goal. Yeah. And what I've, I've learned now uh, through the work of um, Andrew Source, and he's a psychologist and researcher based out of the Netherlands. And he and I have talked quite a bit about this. And when he works with people who are in withdrawal, he says that the best thing people can do for themselves is to stop treating withdrawal like an injury or stop treating withdrawal like an illness and treat it more like an injury because it's really more of a brain injury than it is an illness and so when you're sick yeah you need to stay in bed because your brain need, and your body need to regenerate when you're injured you need to go to rehab yeah. you need to push it so he's he's just like i don't care what my clients do but i just want you to do something hard go learn latin go play chess do anything to force your brain to start creating new connections and wake up again and so i think that me having this weird opportunity and having all these problems to solve and then also finally leaving the country and being in places where I didn't speak the language and I was moving every month and navigating basic stuff like where's the grocery store in this little Thai town that I live in now I was constantly having these little problems to solve that I think was actually helping me move down the path of healing even though at the time it just felt like it is so hard for me to figure out where the grocery store is right now and I feel completely impaired it's interesting too when you get the chance to also take yourself out of the role in the movie that we set up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be the girl who needs this medicine, who does this thing. You're just a girl who's looking for the grocery store. Right. And there's something really liberating because yeah. we really box ourselves in. I mean, you mentioned the identity part, um, which a lot of people go through, good and bad. Um, but I think there's something powerful regardless of getting out of the movie. Mm -hmm. you, you know what didn't change at all? I was still a colossal pain in the ass when I was in Thailand and Cambodia and Croatia, all those things. But I, could, I couldn't blame it on my business partner anymore. I couldn't blame it on being in New York. I couldn't blame it on the men in New York. There was nothing. And so it was just me. Mm. And <laughs> that's a horrible, sobering realization. But I think it's one a lot of people don't really get to encounter very often because it's very, very, very difficult to remove ourselves naturally from all the things we think are the problem yeah it's uh it is a i mean i know that's a painful experience and yet a real gift to be able mm -hmm. to do that so you come out of this experience and i'm i'm just curious um you know may cause side effects your book well first of all when did you f feel good uh, I would say I started to have, in withdrawal, there's a term called windows and waves. And so the windows are times when you feel good or when you feel more like you, when mm -hmm. the, you're just not in crisis. And then the waves are when. Yeah, shit's, shit's going. In the fan. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, the way windows and waves tend to happen for people, it does vary. But for me, I would have the mark of healing for me ended up being more and more time passing in a window than waves. So the length of the waves sort of became irrelevant to me. It had to do more with how much time was passing in between them. And I would say the first year, if I, I mean, I, I think it was, I don't even know if I got a full day where there would be a window in that day. But then after that first year is when I started to get a day and then maybe two, and maybe there's a couple weeks. And then at one point I think I looked around and I was like, oh, it's been like a month. And then I did a wave. And then yeah. it would just get longer and longer. So I consider myself, I considered myself healed from withdrawal after about two years. And that was at the point where I finally felt like, I don't think about this every day. The problems in my life don't seem to be associated with it. I can emotionally regulate much better. And there were still some things that lingered. Like for example, I still uh, have persistent noise sensitivity that can be pretty tricky for me in certain situations i just like i don't know what happened in the wiring mm -hmm. with all this but something changed so i've had to figure out ways to survive in the world while dealing with that and so that's what i did but i don't feel like i'm still in withdrawal because of it if that makes sense yeah now, when you say waves it's it, it's interesting you know we call them good days and bad days mm -hmm. did you get to a point where you could separate and go 
oh yeah no this is just this actually has nothing to do with anything other than i'm having kind of a day yes okay and i think that's a really good question and a really interesting distinction so i work with i don't do a ton of one-on-one work with people getting off of these drugs because it's i don't want to live my whole life in this world yeah. it's for lack of a better word depressing yeah. so i'm very picky <laughs> i'm very picky of who i do work with one-on-one or when i let these stories in um otherwise i prefer to just you know do do my advocacy work to large groups of people and then leave uh but when i work intimately with people on this topic i i tend to track their windows and waves because and the difference between a bad day and a wave typically is that the waves it's almost like some level one there's some level of amnesia around it when you come out of it you're almost like i feel fine and it feels like it happened to somebody else but it was an hour ago it and so it's a very disassociated very, type of yeah but you're totally in it you're to, you're completely wrapped up in in the, whatever story comes up during that time so it's a glitch in the computer yeah and it can come on mm. extremely suddenly and it's usually very hair trigger it doesn't it, it tends to be like a lot of people would describe it as an overreaction it's also why it's very easy to get diagnosed as bipolar in withdrawal because you're swinging around from things that look a bit more manic shall we say to things that look a bit more depressive when in reality you're just in a withdrawal wave and mm -hmm. so uh the amnesia thing is really kind of an interesting thing that kind of seems to distinguish it from a bad day also just the suddenness of which you can be walking in the world fine and then you just fall deep deep off a cliff and it makes no sense and then you're just like trying to dig out did you get a tool when it would come because you had more experience to help you ride it out was there did you get any practice in place um or it did you just sort of go oh i know what this is and i'll just kind of you know wait till it's over a little bit of both i i didn't have any formal practices or anything that there was no getting out of it. It was more how to deal with it. I think that's also another kind of hallmark of a wave is that it's it can be, I think when you're having a bad day, there are things that can pull you out of it, even to an extent like a puppy or or something. You know, yeah. there's just a little bit of movement where mm. it, they're, they're, it's so self-focused in a wave that you you could be in front of the most beautiful thing in the world it doesn't gonna hit it's just not gonna hit um so i did learn to write it out uh, i also started doing sort of a I don't know, spiritual therapy i guess i mean it was definitely look, look how begrudgingly you say that i don't know how to explain you're it. like for me oh, no oh, spiritual it, no practice. it's not that it's just that <laughs> There isn't language to describe what it is in a way that yeah. doesn't, I feel like, automatically shut off the message to a large percentage of people. I don't think saying that you had a you added a different kind of practice yeah. because we are. They always say we're mind, body, and spirit, and if the computer is broken or glitching, the spirit cannot be housed correctly. Yeah, I mean, but you I still could have to connect to it. Yeah, it's like I can't get the signal mm -hmm. if you know up here is yeah. not working. I know we love to think like, oh, we'll just connect with source, and that's great. But if this is not working well, or right. this for that matter, yeah. which we'll get into your gut. Mm -hmm. um, it, the spirit's like yeah f off like i you know so i i don't think there's anything wrong with saying but what how did that show up was it did you create like a mantra or prayer or something that at least hey you're not going to get out of it you're not going to perspective yeah. way you're at, you're not going to do a gratitude practice but was there sort of like hey this is going to pass and it is what it is like what did you tell yourself so I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna alter what you said a little bit because what i actually think was happening was that the spiritual world was coming into me like an absolute fire hose mm. because i think what had happened again is i had been so closed off to it i'd been not home not able to you know connect the radio transmission to a channel in a way and then when i got off these drugs everything came in both like, came in all of it yes mm. and so it was so dark what came in and so i didn't again i wasn't going to be able to go to a traditional therapist to talk about this because i would have been carted off to yeah. the psych hospital okay so then what do you do and 
I had ended up finding someone my mom actually found because she'd been listening to a podcast or a radio or something. And there was this man who did this practice called Compassion Key. And she called me afterwards and she said, I don't know why, but I think you need to reach out to this person. And I, literally when I got that email, I think I was on my floor just sobbing. And I was just at that point like, Fuck I'll it. do like, anything. We'll do whatever. Yeah. And so I reached out to him and, and the closest I've kind of heard about uh, like a comparison to a more main, more well-known or mainstream um, modality is inner family systems. Yeah, it's kind of, so that's sort of compassion key sort of does that, but it it allowed for me to talk about what I was see seeing in my head, like the intrus. Sometimes it was intrusive thoughts in the world, but it was also just these almost like fantasy worlds that didn't make any sense, mm -hmm. and it allowed me to. It didn't feel like we were doing therapy on me. It felt like we were doing therapy on, you know, the, the bird ghost that was attached to a cross in mm. 2000 BC. And I didn't know what to make of that, but like, that's what came through. Yeah. And so we were able to talk about things very abstractly. It felt more like doing therapy on the soul as opposed to doing therapy on the mind of the body. And I was, that distinction was really important for me when, when so much was coming in and, and I still don't really know what to make of that. I mean, in some circles, it would be very well explained by past lives and other circles, it would be explained as, you know, some sort of like quantum physics connecting to the matrix mm -hmm. and other circles it might just be described as this is the metaphor your mind created to make an explanation of the situation. I decided I didn't care what it was and that I was just going to deal with whatever showed up that day. Yeah. And on top of that, the therapy was remote, which was really important because he was in Florida. He could not call the New York authorities on me. And also I was allowed to be in my pajamas at home, yeah, not sitting in an office where I'm like, what are they writing down? Having to look someone in the eye when you're admitting these horrible things you're thinking. I felt so vulnerable, but I felt safe in my house. And then being able to hang up the phone and just go cry or be in bed or take a shower and not having to then be out in society was huge yeah the immediate you get to be where you need and want mm -hmm. to be yep and he was far away <laughs> so where did you get the idea to write the book because i mean that's not that's an interesting departure yeah. from it, it makes sense obviously now looking at it mm -hmm. but when did you get the idea and then have the courage to say, oh yeah, I'm gonna not only talk, I'm gonna take on a project that I haven't done something like this before that is hard, no matter what kind of book you're writing. Yeah. And then to talk about something that really isn't talked about much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm getting a tone or a theme about you that you have a persistence and a kind of a stubbornness. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously I know where you get, uh, where you got the, the wattage from. Yeah. But where do you, how did you get help? How did you start the project? How did you put it together? The origin story for that, um, I haven't talked about it too much, and it's pretty amusing. Uh, so I was listening to a lot of Tim Ferriss at the time <laughs> because, again, I was just like, I need help, so I'm listening to whatever. And he had A.J. Jacobs on, who mm -hmm. I've now had a few conversations with, and just the man delights me. Mm -hmm. And A.J. Jacobs was doing these giant year-long experiments and I just, there was something about that that just spoke to me. And so I was in, I was at the point in my recovery where I was starting to have windows that were lasting a significant amount of time in that like, I felt like I could get a few days in without t crashing. And mm -hmm. so it was starting to feel safe to go back out into the world a little bit. But I had also existed under this thing for 15 years where everything was so negative I was so used to saying no, I didn't really know how to go out and be this new person. And so I think I listened to this AJ, to AJ, I talked to Tim, and I said, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do an experiment. Because I was also unemployed at this time, so I had all the time in the world. I said, I'm going to do an experiment where I just say yes to every yes or no question that's asked of me. And I don't care what the question is. Like, if they ask me if I want cream and sugar in my coffee, I say yes, even though I don't like sugar in my coffee. Like, we are just saying yes. And we're just gonna see what happens. And I, I made up some rules for myself. I said I was allowed to say no to anything that would like maim my body. Like if someone said get a face tattoo, I could say no. I don't think I would have said no if like I was supposed to get it on my arm or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, if someone said give me all your savings, I could say no to that. I could say no to anything that wasn't in the spirit of the yes quest that I called it. 
and anyone who's trying to take advantage of it. And so I started doing this and my plan was to do it for a year, but I about I only did it for 50 days because in that 50 days, uh, it was pretty unremarkable. I mean, it was mostly just having coffee I didn't like and going to mm -hmm. bands I didn't want to see and, <laughs> you know, generally just being a little bit more social than I think I'm used to used to being. But a couple of things happened. The first one was is that I was in Vancouver at the time. I'd sort of taken a sabbatical from my break or from my travel. And someone asked if I wanted to go to Uruguay or no, Chile. So I ended up cutting Vancouver off and going down to Chile. At that same time, uh, I had had a literary agent because my bakery, we came out with a book mm -hmm. and she and I were catching up and she said something, I sort of gave her a vague overview about what was going on. Yeah. And she was like, do you want to write a book about that? I think I could sell it. Says, I, a, says I, a book agent. And I just remember <laughs> thinking like, oh, shit, <laughs> like I am in this yes quest. I have to say yes. And so I said yes, thinking that it would be a much easier process than it was. And I did realize pretty quickly that at that point I was in Uruguay. I had agreed to write this book and I was just kind of like, okay, I think we can stop having coffee that you don't like because we now have a direction. And so I started writing the book and took five years, but we got there. You know, as a as an adult, now you're an adult, uh, mm -hmm. whatever that means, you know, listen, the whole idea is don't lose the kid, but let's just say you're in your 30s at yep. this point when this is all happening. Are you feeling, because this happens to a lot of people, they think my life is supposed to be in a certain place mm -hmm. by now. Mm -hmm. And you're traveling and taking on new projects and new sabbaticals and doing this. So, I didn't know what I was doing. So, <laughs> But I, I appreciate that the it feels like that that wasn't sort of you're trying to survive. You're yeah. like, listen, Gabby, I'm having voices in my head. You're where, you're talking to me about like where my life is supposed to be, but you weren't navigating any of that artificial pressure we put on ourselves. Like, oh, should I meet somebody and do I want to have a family or any of that nonsense? You know, not I, I say it not as nonsense, but meaning we we sell our self these stories all the time. I just delayed that existential crisis. I'm having that now. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> That's where we're at now. But <laughs> for me, it actually, the best way I can describe what the process of coming back into the world felt like, mm -hmm. it was kind of like a second puberty. Yeah. So, you know, you're extremely emotional. You don't know what you like. Like everything's changing. It was, but I'm doing it at 30, 31. And so that process for me, there was a sense of curiosity around it because as I started to get better, it was kind of like, okay, what do I actually like? Like, because I didn't like anything that I used to like. Nothing in my life was resonant anymore. So I realized I hated black and red, which was what my entire house was, or my entire apartment was decorated in. Oh, interesting. My taste changed. I didn't like the same music or the same TV shows or the same people. Did it get more upbeat? Yes, mm. yes. Like, I just wanna be around white stuff all the time now. <laughs> Did you change your friends? A lot, like friends changed. Uh, I've just, in part because I just started to have less tolerance for people I didn't want to spend time with. But also there were people who didn't understand what, what was happening. And so I just kind of let it just fall away. I, Cause again, I didn't, I was, I was like a completely different person. So I had created a completely different life, which is probably why I was depressed because I wasn't supposed to be in that life. Yeah. So there was a couple of years where it was just like, let's just see what I want and what I like and let's look around this corner and see how that feels. And then I was also writing the book, which is its own exercise and struggle. So it's really not been until now that I've started asking myself all those questions. And then that, there's the extra layer of like, maybe I should have thought about this more when I was 28 or 30 because I don't know what I want or any of these things. Have you, have you gotten to the place where can you hear how loud that it is? My husband is very passionate about all things. Is it impacting us here? It's unbelievable. You talk about she has a noise sensitivity. Imagine if she was married to Larry. Oh well, it's my multiple God. pitches. I can handle one at a time. Oh, it's one <laughs> yeah. full it's one full pitch. We'll just see. Hey, listen, I know. See, I'm opposite. Like I'm very, I have like an internal personality in certain ways. I'm very direct, but mm -hmm. Laird is the one who keeps me like, oh, I'm okay. He's like, come on out here. I'm like, okay, coming out, you know, um, is we, 
our, our lives, you know, they, they, we watch movies, we watch TV shows, and they go, this is what life looks like. Mm-hmm. Have you gotten to the place where I know that it was at the cost of you of 15 years plus mm-hmm. that you realize also what a gift all this has been in ways that you don't even fully understand yet that you will not only will have the way to navigate and the tools to help yourself but also help other people i would say i don't know it's probably an 80 20 split uh i am enough i have enough spiritual connection within myself now to pretty much live by the phrase it's not happening to you it's happening for you yeah and that has just come through there's no way you go through like withdrawal is the hardest thing I've ever been through. It, it, the most challenging thing by far, and that includes major surgery I just had on my leg, which sucks. Losing my dad, like just, you know, general existence. So it's just absolutely the hardest thing. But I know, like, just the amount of growth and the way it's changed my life, and the fact that it makes everything else feel easy. Mm. There, there's, there's huge, huge, huge gifts in it, and that's one of the things I really try and remind people when they're going through it is just that they one day they're gonna like this is just such a gift and it and it helps you it's just a fast track into knowing who you are which knowing who you are and liking yourself is probably the greatest thing in the world yeah better than everything else so the fact that i have that and it is is huge and there's also there's a huge amount of grief uh that for whatever reason this year has just been real heavy around everything um because i made so many choices not being home yeah and i don't know what my life would have been like if i had been home and it just like i lost my entire 20s i didn't do the things that i should have been doing in my 20s so i had more clarity when i got to my 30s or things that are more difficult to do in your 30s than in your 20s and what are those things even are it just it just made for a real like there's there's absolutely no map and you know you asked about like you know the existential crisis of families and all those sorts of things Mm -hmm. it's like i couldn't i couldn't make that decision when i was medicated but if you ask me to make it when i'm 38 well then there's a lot more pressure there's a lot more at stake and there's a lot more just like wondering and it just, I hate that some guy who I'd met for five minutes made that choice for me. Yeah. It just, it just hurts. Yeah. And maybe that's like a kind of loss that, you know, maybe we don't get over, but we just get a different relationship with. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. It surprised me that it's come back again. Like, I kind of thought I had... I thought I'd gotten through it, but then that's such a naive thing to think. Like, I know grief really well, and I know that grief waits for you until you're ready to do the work. Yeah. And it also will expand and contract based on where your life is. So it, it's no surprise Yeah. That, it, that it's come back to show up, but it doesn't offer you any direction. And there's a lesson in that, too. Such a lesson. <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> So on some of the technical components, it, in some ways, it to me, when I hear you talk, it feels like you went through a lot of this alone. Yeah. I, I mean, did you have a community? Did you, w- was there any part of that that was, that was instrumental in helping you stay on the path? Or was this sort of you, you, and you? I didn't really know what was happening in the way that I do now because again I was under the impression that this was supposed to something that was supposed to last a couple of weeks and so it kept lasting longer and longer but at that point I had come so far but I still wasn't very forthcoming with what was happening and so the when I was traveling the the thing was this um it was this now pretty much defunct company that tried to send 70 people around the world together <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> So there were 70 what, people. What, what, <laughs> I, sh- I showed up oh on day God. one in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and it was like, here's 70 people to meet. And I'm just like, like you thought New York was bad? Yeah. 
Did you have any her. loud talkers? You got loud talkers oh. that are offending you? Well, not only that, but then there's like, because, you know, a lot of these other countries, there aren't, they oh. don't build in the same way we do. No. So it's like there's someone with a hacksaw, like oh, yeah. literally constructing the building behind, like while you're in it. Yeah. And so I was having a hor- horrible time. And I, uh, I remember was, so we, there was the 70 people and it, it took me a, a long time to get everybody's names and like, like months, because I just was not having it it was just too much for me and I, I know that a lot of the people were not they were kind of like what's up, what's up with this person yeah what's up with this yeah. what's up with this very intense woman over here yeah and I just kind of I shared what was going on with one or two people and then just pretty much separated myself and then what happened though is that at the end uh our group had dwindled unsurprisingly to 36. oh geez <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of attrition <laughs> it didn't work too well and and I had I had taken a like a sabbatical, my sabbatical in the middle of it because I just needed, I wasn't doing well, and so I left for a while and came back. And when I came back, it was rather contented or contested because the group had really bonded while I was gone and oh. gotten smaller. There was a lot of people who had left dramatically, and I tried to come back peacefully. But was this a reality show or a religious we, we cult? Jo- we go <laughs> joke they should have filmed it because it would have been great television. Holy cow! But I came back, and in that period of time, I had decided I was going to write the book, and I decided I needed to just tell them the truth. And so we had a night where Mm. where everyone was, it was like a little talent show or something, and I wrote a little piece and just basically explained what had happened, and it was really cathartic, and I kind of, that group really came around me, Mm -hmm. and that was so important. But other than that, it was really mostly myself, and then I was... My mom was the, she was the anchor. I would call her and it didn't matter where I was in the world, she'd pick up and it was just her telling me every day that she could hear her kid coming back Mm -hmm. and her telling me that I could get through it. And she just kept saying, I know you, I I carried you. I knew you before you were medicated, you're still in there. And I needed to hear that. She was the only person who could tell me that. Did did she feel guilty, you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, parents, that's what we do anyway. But I'm wondering if she, does she, and and that's not about ratting on your mom. That's about, there's a lot of players in these stories. And if there's been amends or something that happened, because I know as a parent, I I carry guilt for certain things Mm -hmm. because there's kind of no way around it. I don't think there's a way around it. There, it's just what you do. You're, we, we, we joke, haha, in our house about like, It'll be interesting to see all the ways that we fucked up our kids, you know, Laird and I. And I I tell my friends, I go, listen, here's what I'm aiming for. (laughs) I'm aiming for all the things I'm going to feel comfortable apologizing for at a Thanksgiving dinner. You know, when they're 30 and they're going, and yeah, no, (laughs) I'm trying to do the ones that I will feel comfortable apologizing for. Yeah. I think that, you know, my mom is... uh, Someone, a psychologist, read my book recently and just said, God, your mom is just the angel of the story. Mm. And I said, yeah, she, she really is. I mean, and she's, I, she's a very, she's a very whole human being. I think she's a rare whole human. And so she, honest to God, she's just like, I did the best I could with what I knew at the time. And had I known differently, I would have done differently. And she was the one who, for all those 15 years, was saying you want to mm-hmm. look at this you know but she couldn't do anything about it yeah and you seem formidable yeah but now it's really cool so when my mom saw what i went through with withdrawal and also the type the compassion key counseling that i was doing she decided to get certified and so now she's one of about 50 master practitioners in the world who does this work and she helps people get off their drugs mm. and she loves working with the most complicated clients which is great because most people are just like no nah, give me someone easy but she likes she likes the complicated people so she's been doing this she sold her business and she's been doing this and has been doing it for about eight years eight nine years or so and she's got a roster of people who have gone through this horrible thing and have gone through horrible things in their lives which is why they were medicated in the first place and they're now out living Mm. and so it's really cool yeah you say in your book about it not being really a linear path of healing and i just Mm -hmm. want to highlight that because sometimes it is a step forward and two back and you know one up one down yeah just you jump through time (laughs) a little bit (laughs) right it's (laughs) three-dimensional don't tell anyone um 
but yeah, I just, I thought that that was, it's, yeah. it's just important. Uh, I think about that too sometimes when I'm driving around in Los Angeles and I feel like so many people that are there, it's that they're either not able to get the, the medication or they're off the medication. Mm-hmm. Like you see the suffering and you think, this is something that we don't understand. Yeah. Is there, I know in, in the Scandinavian countries they're doing some, certain things kind of better. Are you kind of hopeful? Because maybe part of me believes, or I want to believe, and if not, then I think we should all be involved in doing it, that part of the medical system, whether it was on purpose or not, that we've created, we're, it, we're, we'll have to deconstruct it because mm-hmm. we've never been more right. unwell right. in every way, in mm-hmm. every metric. Mm-hmm. So we are. I feel at this, people like you coming out, other people, we're in this deconstruction. Do you think, what what is in place of? So we, we also have kids now who have all this verbiage. I When I grew up, you, you'd, you'd say, I'm pissed, mm-hmm. I'm having a bad day. You never knew, you never talked about being depressed. Yeah. That was like something you watched if you were watching like, uh, you know, The Odd Couple or like yeah. whatever weird show you watched. It, it was like, now they are equipped. Yeah. And they all self-diagnose, and it's also kind of sexy. You mm-hmm. you kind of alluded mm-hmm. to the, you know, this overcorrection. Mm-hmm. Do you do you see? Well, first of all, do we are we going to get worse before we get better, and and actually give young people the tools to realize like, part of life is hard. Mm-hmm. You'll experience loss. You'll you'll feel shitty sometimes for no absolute reason. You'll look at your whole life and you'll say, "What's my problem?" And you'll go, "And." Yeah. Do you do you see us? Where do you see things kind of netting out now? Um, because I I think something's obviously going to give. Yeah. I think you remember during COVID when they were talking about the cave shaped economy recovery. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what I see happening here, and I, I see that happening. Uh, I think you, did you have you had either Casey or Callie Means on? At yeah, one I've point, had Casey. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you, I think you could basically take everything he said, mm-hmm. swap the word "big food" with "big pharma," yeah. or "processed food" with "psychiatric drugs." It's the same playbook and it's the same. Well, and some of the same owners, which is kind of amazing. I always love that. Like, I love that Bear is also making my food. (laughs) It's like fucking great. But anyway. But but the reason why I say that is because I think we're going to see it in in, in that revolution too. And and so the thing is, is that, and again, even in, I think that this is what's happening across the board. It's just that there is an expansion of awareness Mm -hmm. and because we're all sort of creating this world together, we are just expanding, we're expanding the the variations on what's possible. And there are the extremes on either end keep going this way, but there's a lot more in the middle. But what I I see happening is at, at the same time, which is so interesting to me, is that you have the rise of TikTok influencers Mm. and these these fast information machines basically saying you have adhd if you sleep like this or you know the telehealth the being able to get the drugs the access is so easy and there's there's an ability here to to not question anything at all to get exactly what you think you want to diagnose yourself in the process to get disability for it and then to create an entire existence under the guise of you having this disorder that you created and diagnosed yourself, literally without ever going to a doctor. You see a nurse practitioner maybe. Right. And that is one funnel. And then you have these well-meaning parents who are so scared of that or who think that every little hiccup is that, that they are funneling their kids straight into that particular funnel. At the same time, you also have huge cohorts of people saying, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. We're, we're sicker, we're more mentally ill, and we're prescribing more. This, what are we, what doesn't make sense about this, right? So then they start, you start pulling at those threads and you start seeing what's underneath and you start getting researchers who are looking into this and you start having words like antidepressant withdrawal hit major media. Mm-hmm. And more and more people are saying, yeah, I've been on these drugs for 20 years and I'm not better, but now I can't get off of them. And then more and more people start talking about it. And then you bring in 
the food problem and the environment problem and all these other things and we start to get a much fuller picture of why we're so fat sick and unhappy but the people who they're, they're, you can funnel your kids into that too you can funnel yourself into that yeah but it's just meaning it just means the group of people are going like this yeah and then it's wider more volatile and so forth and i think you asked earlier about like the common things that people get mad about about well, my work well i mean you're not work. a scientist bro. no no no. but i never i never I say mean, i'm a scientist i'm joking that, i mean by the <laughs> well, way no, that happens all the time i know i'm joking it's like you know oh well, you're not a scientist and you're like yeah but this is my experience well, and also, it's not unique to me but i always love that like oh don't do your own research oh okay let but it's me also like if you want to talk science then let's talk to science because the science right now is very clear on what's happening with all oh. this but they don't want to hear that and then they will say well you're stopping people from getting life-changing medications and then it's just oh yeah like, that's the best it's so lazy so i have a friend elijah and he always says you have to be the ceo of your own health mm -hmm. and when i do this show right like my real hope is to encourage people and give and and expose them to people like you to give them tools to be able to make better choices for themselves exactly. i'm not here to tell you what to do how to eat how to move none of it um but i will say this well, if people have sort of gone down a path being well intended but maybe it actually wasn't the right path mm -hmm. i think it's would be better for people to say i made a mistake mm -hmm. we all make mistakes mm -hmm. And I'm going to pivot now and do something else. Yep. So let's not play games. There's all this is a big money game. People taking medications. That's what this is. There is a small group, a very small group of people mm -hmm. that are genuinely clinically depressed, or have anxiety, or some of these other things you talked about. The literature suggests roughly 15%. Right. And by the way, 11%, just so people are clear, of the people on these drugs are 12 and older are on antidepressants. And again, this is 2018. <laughs> right, and, and and the majority are women over 60. One in four. And I understand why. Yeah. I understand why. Well, it's prescribed for menopause. I was gonna say, it's menopause, bitches. Like, yeah. you're like, I'm crazy. There's like, the, the partner's <laughs> like, can you give her something? <laughs> I She's mean, like, it's all muted, but I'm just saying. This is, this but, is a tale as old as time. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it my is, grandmother, no. okay? So <laughs> this all, the psychiatric drug thing. Yeah, Prozac really, or yeah, Valium, right? It was, it was Valium. came yeah. about in the, in the mid-1900s. We learned as she was dying that she had been on Valium most of her life. It explained most of my mother's childhood yeah. in a way that was kind of cathartic. But then what happened was, is she goes, she's, she's dying. <laughs> And they keep pulling her off the fucking Valium. And so she's going into withdrawal while yeah. she's... That would be the time to be on the Valium. Probably, right? right? But her <laughs> husband was pulling her off of it because he had been in charge of her medication. And, like, I can't tell you how many men in the age, you know, like, in 60s and 70 years old read my book and have said to me, this explained my childhood. Yeah. And and so this is this is not new. We've just been giving it different names and been not fully aware mm. of what's been happening. But this has been, it, you just cannot be flippant and reckless with this stuff. No. But we are. Do you have a practice? Do you have something that grounds you? So I'm assuming, I'm gonna make an assumption based that you're a chef <laughs> and the things I've learned about you. You're using food as medicine yeah. and movement. Mm -hmm. Do you have some kind of mantra or sort of other decompressing grounding kind of practices that have been supportive it, the biggest thing for me now is i try and put at least an hour in between me and my phone in the morning like mm. the phone lives downstairs i mean i've i've gone full full pain in the ass on all that stuff in the sense that you know i stand in front of my red light and i take walks and i ground and i like the barefoot shoes and I try not to bore people with that stuff but i do it and it helps and i like it yeah and but beyond that it's really just it's there's just been this realization that it started with withdrawal but it's gotten more and more intense over the years where it's just like there is no right way to do this and like like kind of nothing matters not in a nihilistic way but in just like a it doesn't matter like go make art even if it's bad go take a walk with your shoes off who cares don't hurt anybody else and like you don't necessarily have to broadcast it all the time but that right. it's just not that complicated 
I just try and be in nature and I try to surround myself with either people I can help or people who make me feel good to the extent that I can. Um, and I try and look at the sun, not directly, but like be in the sunlight yeah. in the morning, in the evening. I walk my dog. Is yes. that the same dog? No. Oh. Looks the same, but no, not the same dog. But I don't know. It just, for me, it's just, I'm just getting more and more basic and it's all about addition by subtraction. And the mm. more I do that, I'm not going to say things get easier, but the, the, the less crap I introduce that I have to fix. Yeah. Do you have any no's on the list, like alcohol or anything like that? Or I don't they... really drink anymore. Like no. I will maybe have one. Are you allowed to drink when you're on all that medication? You're not supposed to, oh. but I, I, I did. <laughs> don't worry. Definitely did. Uh, but now the, the biggest thing is it, it dawned on me that like if I get a cut, I put alcohol on my cut so it's disinfectant. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm drinking alcohol, I'm pretty much just pouring bleach down my entire gut biome. And I was having so many gut problems after getting off the drugs. And so I was just decided this was dumb. Also, why would I want to do something that makes me hang out with people I don't want to hang out with? Right. So for me, it just became useless. But I'll, you know, I'll have like a glass of champagne or something every now and again. Um, every lady says that, don't they? I mean, I'll have a glass of champagne. Because champagne is fantastic. <laughs> I know, that's what Also, I mean. the way they make it in Champagne, France, like it doesn't bother me. Yeah, it, well, you're, and so, you're you high know, level, you're high I'm level. Maybe I'm just delusional, but it's delicious and I don't get hung over the next day. So yeah, I'm gonna have a glass of champagne if someone gives it to me, I for think sure. That's, um, um, you did mention, I, I wanna bring this up so people are aware of it. I believe there is like a gene test. Oh, yeah. That feels important the to pharma, mention. Uh, pharmacogenetic stuff. Yes, yeah. can we get into that? So yeah, that's interesting. So you're talking about uh, pharmacogenetic testing, which basically, it, it's there's multiple organizations that do it a gene site is the one that i use i'm not affiliated with it i there's plenty of others but basically what they do is they just uh compare your specific genetic sequence against multiple psychiatric drugs which has its use but people get it really wrong about what it's for like what it does is it'll spit out a result that's like stoplights like these drugs are red don't take them mm. these drugs are yellow watch out and these drugs are green and people will say, oh, this drug is a green, I should be able to take it and be just fine. It's not what the test is designed for. The test just tells you how you are going to metabolize the drug. And that's important to know because if you're a non-metabolizer for some of these drugs, they can build up to toxic levels yeah. in your system and that's when people have really bad reactions, whether or not they're violent outbursts or they are um, bad physical effects. There can also be drug-drug interactions that will bog up one part of the system. and so. It's just helpful to know, but it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be used either as diagnosis or as a way to say like, oh, well, well this drug is gonna work for you. It's not mm -hmm. telling you whether or not anything's gonna work or not work. It's just like, are you going to metabolize it as expected or not? The flip side is if you're an ultra rapid metabolizer or something, like I'm an ultra rapid metabolizer for caffeine and melatonin, mm -hmm. it doesn't touch me. So I probably, you know, I'm not a big fan of melatonin anyway, but it would explain why when I was messing around with it, it never worked and why I can drink a cup of coffee at four in the afternoon and more or less be Go to fine. Sleep. Yeah, you're a fast metabolizer. Right. So if you're a fast metabolizer of another drug, like in psychiatric drug or any drug, then you might need more of it. For example, if you're under anesthesia, it might be important to know if you're yeah. the most rapid metabolizer of certain drugs used in anesthetic cocktails so you don't wake up. Uh, when I had my knee surgery recently, I actually took my results to my anesthesiologist and he was like, this is awesome. And he changed my co cocktail based on it. Is, was this a fitness mishap? Yeah, I was training oh. for a gymnastics competition. Oh my God. <laughs> it was 10 days out, <laughs> took bad landing during my floor routine. Oh no. I had music and sparkly leotard, but I went to the hospital and said. <laughs> what do you do about the pain meds for recovery? Uh, I hated that part of it. I um, just begrudgingly took what I needed to take because yeah. I had to. Well, but... sleep is, becomes more important sometimes. Well, also just uh, when the nerve blocker wears off and you're not on pain medication because I was stubborn and refused, mm -hmm. I, I very quickly pivoted on that. That was not a level of pain I was equipped to take. Yeah. So I just, but I took it for the minimum amount, amount of time. Then I actually transitioned to using Amanita Mascara mushrooms, which mm -hmm. are not. That a girl. Yeah, they're not. Uh, there's no psilocybin in them, so they're not a psychedelic mushroom of any mm. kind, but they have um, a compound in them that adds kind of a mild anesthetic 
effect and that helped me transition off the gabapentin which i did not want to be on yeah so your job at least for now i feel i do feel like you're not going to be being a working chef i i would like to manifest that Gabby. i think you are um what have you learned because i know you cooked for athletes mm -hmm. as well just from a completely different area what have what has shown up for you as some of your favorite go-to's just for because i'd imagine you spend a lot of time thinking about gut and gut mm -hmm. health yeah just from a really practical point of view uh what do you what do you like that's easy and realistic because i think yeah. what happens with the gut it's a complicated place yes. the good and the bad what does that mean which ones yeah. um but there are some practices that kind of are supportive mm -hmm. The first thing I would recommend for people if they can is to get a, like a stool test, like a GI map test, because I know that when I was trying to figure this stuff out, I did go to my doctor and they did do a test, but it was it was so basic. I think they tested for like some parasites and that was it. And weirdly, they didn't catch the parasite that the other test did catch because I did pick something up. But a GI map and equivalent test is going to give you a much broader reveal about what's going on. And so if, if you're someone who just like is just going around the circle of colonoscopies and you can't figure it out like try the try that in a some sort of functional medicine doctor who can actually read it which is really important but what the way i work with my athletes primarily and the way i work with myself too is we're we're strict in the sense that we we don't do any gluten we don't do any conventional dairy uh, which we, means you do raw dairy we'll do raw dairy if we can find it in nevada like the I quakers and the and the uh men Mennonites. Yeah, they have good dairy. Yeah. They go hard. Yeah. 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 I would. Do you see how I like have to the, cross the border to Do you see how like milk? the feds bust them in like Pennsylvania? It's so stupid. It's weird. Like, it was so stupid. They're on their wagon with their horses yeah. and they come in and they bust them for their raw dairy. Meanwhile, there was like some some <laughs> outbreak in something in almond milk recently and like. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. break them down. Yeah, in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> what is, so no dairy, no dairy. Like, or typical dairy, gluten free. Yeah, makes sense. gluten free. And again, the gluten is just like, it's just such low hanging fruit. And especially for the pro athletes, like, there's other ways we can get you your carbs and uh no seed oils and then we don't if i do sugar i usually use ground date powder to sweeten things low coconut sugar i'm not not at all afraid of honey or maple syrup or anything like that but and then um the kind of surprising thing is like we don't we actually sometimes will pull back on vegetables uh mm -hmm. there's again much very like eat your vegetables type thing but I just keep hearing people, they're just like, my gut's all screwed up. Well, what'd you eat? I had a kale salad that was this big. I'm eating so healthy. And I'm just kind of like, I, yeah, it's, it's tough so on you. hard to digest. Yeah. Like if you ate a steak, you wouldn't be feeling like this. <laughs> so we do a lot of, um, what if you have, do you have plant-based athletes? Nope. And she, I think she has her cutting knife in her hand when she says it. I, I appreciate that. You know, I, you know, you, you, no, listen, I get it. I get it. I get it. I, like most things, there are exceptions to the rule, but I don't think that that should be the rule. Yeah, I get it. And I don't find that it works out well for like, I mean, I'm, I'm working with extremely high level athletes. Yeah. They're, they're asking me to yeah. pump them with meat and organ meat and yeah. organ meat's good. Yeah. We do a ground and liver mm -hmm. heart. Laird smokes some, um, he, uh, he went hunting and he uh, got some elk and he smokes on the barbecue with mm -hmm. our turmeric creamer, the yep. liver, because liver, oh, yeah. it's tough. Yep. So, and he, he, he and one of my daughters learned how to make, um, they make a really good pate, but with coconut milk. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Well, that makes sense, it's fat. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Anyway, yeah. you're putting it out there. Like even in your social media, it's very yes. direct. It's very honest and transparent. Your book is that way. Yes. And what happens is you're having a big conversation, a nuanced conversation. Mm -hmm. You've had your own experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're literally putting your heart and life on the line. And then mm -hmm. people will, most people are gonna respond and you're gonna help a lot of people. How do you navigate when some you know human who's having a bad day or life they want to take it out on you. Do you have a something in place that you protect yourself or you have enough perspective or use that like little anger in you that you've used in positive ways to defend yourself? Like, what do you do? I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you have some advice here because I do not feel like my skin is getting thicker. You don't? I, I really don't. Um, and 
I, I do believe in the work enough to keep going, but I will usually have some sort of temporary extreme reaction where, where I'll delete Instagram off my phone for like four days and just go dark. I mean, I, I go dark a lot more than I used to, which is really frustrating because it's like, I don't, I would love to have the capacity to talk about this all the, the mm -hmm. time. I mean, I, have the, I love having conversations like this. If I could just talk to people in person oh. and public speaking most days, I'd be great. But there's something about the words coming through mm -hmm. where I can feel the energy behind it that it's just, it's like someone showed up to dinner and I didn't invite them. And so I'm happy to have a conversation with someone I don't agree with and have a nuanced discussion about it. Yeah. I, there was, um, there was a psychiatrist at Harvard, actually. Who, oh, Harvard. Yeah. They're very reputable right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I uh, had a... Uh, he came out with an op-ed that was arguing to make antidepressants available over the counter, to which I understandably was like, this is the worst idea anyone has ever had. Like, yeah. that was my response to it. And he got proper screwed on Twitter. Like, there was a lot of coming well, out. Well, did of he have any grants or anything? Did anyone look into that? Uh, there is some conflict. Well, there might be some conflict of interest there. He hmm. he owns a he owns a lab, but... The, the oh, he owns a lab? Yeah. Oh. Well, like, not like a... I can't remember the details of it. Is the lab or nonprofit? But mm -hmm. it's a little bit irrelevant because what happened was I reached out to him and I said, "Can I interview you for my? Can I barbecue you on yeah, my? <laughs> can I interview you for my dinky little newsletter that doesn't have that many people?" And the reason why I said it that way is because he said the Daily Mail did a hit piece on me, and I read it and I was like, eh, "I don't know if it was a hit piece. It seemed like kind of accurate." But, um, but I said. I don't have that many followers. Like, mm -hmm. this is not going to go out to millions of people. This would be for a small group, and I want to get your perspective on this. And I really did. Yeah. And so he agreed, and he read my book, and we had like a 90 minute long conversation that never got nasty. And I actually understand where he was coming from now. I don't fully agree with it. And I think that it was based on some maybe just different ways that we view the world. And also he hasn't been through withdrawal in the way that I have, right. but I can't fault him for that. And he actually made some points where I was like, I'm, I'm actually gonna agree with you that there is a world in which I can understand that Ha, like is this about access somebody who doesn't have access and they're really going through a hard time no it was it was actually more about um i mean it was a little bit about that but there was an argument to be made that if they're easily more easily accessed then it, and you put some sort of uh requirement like informational requirement before you could get them, kind of like, sort of like buying Sudafed. Mm -hmm. But he was saying if you had to watch a video or get, I know, but here's the thing. He's like, if you had to watch a video or read something or take a short test, you would actually be more informed about them than you would if you could go to a doctor. And that's unfortunately true. Oh, that's true. interesting. And so that was a really interesting, like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. I still think I'm like, I still think this is a huge problem. I also don't think it'll ever happen uh, because there's a black box, black box warning on antidepressants, so it's probably unlikely that's ever going to be made over the counter. Also, there are so many legal issues involved if like someone takes a Zoloft and then kills themselves, who's responsible? Yeah. Right. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. And we talked about all this though, and we actually formed like a working relationship with each other, and we've been in contact, and it was really delightful in a way. And I'm I'm so glad it happened. And it just spoke to the fact that it's not about not having nuanced conversations. Right. And there's so much nuance that we didn't get into today. I mean, like that's part of the problem is that when you know we're driving through LA and what you see on the streets is not the same as the teenage girl who's sad because her dad died and yet we treat them the same, yeah. right? But we didn't even talk about that nuance. Yeah. And, and, and so as to how I handle it, I, I don't, I don't handle it well. I don't like it. I don't know what to do about it. Um, I try and put distance in between myself and the comment section, but that doesn't always work because a lot of times there's really good information there too. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things I want to hear and experiences and people teach me things in the comments. So I don't know. I'm lost I feel and like, confused. I feel like you'll get there. <laughs> you'll get there. You'll do it a little longer. It's been eight years. <laughs> Sometimes you just ask people, no, like whatever. Somebody writes you something, just write back, is this a bot? And then just move on. That's smart. Or, I'm kidding, but you know, it doesn't, That's smart. it doesn't really matter because no. remember what they say. The reason we respond to the one negative comment, not the hundred positive mm -hmm. is because it only takes one thing to take us down. Yeah. So that's just our biology yeah. chirping through. It's true. And you, That's a good way of thinking you, about you're it. You're like, don't worry about it. Yeah. You're fine. Um, 
Okay, last two questions. Okay. What do you hope when you wrote this book, if somebody read it, what, what do you hope that they were going to get from it? I wrote that book for two reasons. One, I wrote the book I wish I had had because I think I just would have been less of a mess if I had had any clue that what was happening to me was was normal under the circumstances. It was a very mm. abnormal experience, but it was normal given what I was going through. So I wanted to make sure that anybody who's going through it could read my book and see themselves in it and say, okay, like, especially with the, the intrusive thoughts, that's something that I was so nervous to talk about and it almost didn't make it into the book because I was afraid of what people would say. Not, not what they would say, I just didn't, I thought I would be delegitimized if I said that. And then I realized that's exactly the reason why I have to put this in there. Yeah. And so I wanted to make people f feel okay if they're also having violent intrusive thoughts because I think a lot of us have had those, but we're not, there's no safe space to talk about it. So that I also wanted to make it, write a book that was written from a perspective that was, um, made it very, like I, I didn't want there to be any space in between what the time that the book had happened and the reader, if that makes sense. Yep. So I wrote it in first person present, so you're with me the whole time, yeah. in part because I wanted practitioners and clinicians who read it to understand what it was like to be the patient and to not diagnose them as bipolar in the middle of it, even though it absolutely clinically met all the definitions. Yeah. And then I also wanted something that caregivers, family members, husbands, wives, parents could reference to understand what their person was going through because my mom didn't know really the full extent of everything and so many parents don't know um i've got one of my closest friends right now has been going through like it's pretty rough prozac withdrawal and prozac is not known to cause horrible withdrawal but he's going through it and his 85 year old dad is reading the book mm -hmm. and it's helping him understand his son his 40 year old son yeah so that's why I wrote it the way I did, and that's what I hope to get out of it, is just that it, it reaches the three groups, the patients, the clinicians, and the caregivers, yeah. and helps them understand. It's very honest, and that is why it's impactful. And uh, I think uh, honoring those, those groups mm -hmm. is everything. Yeah. Is it different for men and women? I feel like women were taught even younger, we're allowed to kind of talk about our feelings and like, yeah. this is hard. And I feel like with men there, it's just sort of, yeah. is there is there any information around that kind of part of this is even harder for men than women because they don't say things that sound weird to them? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that, you know, there's, there's no research as far as I know um, that I don't even think there's any research in antidepressants about the way they affect males versus females differently. Mm -hmm. If there is, it's not something that comes up commonly. But I know, I know that you know at least with working the per with the person I'm working with now, he he talks to me a lot about like one of the things that happens during withdrawal is you can just get like, super weepy. Oh, and I'm sure your girlfriend or wife would love that. No, I'm joking, yeah. but no, you know, I know what exactly, I mean? It's like, like he, get it together. He's like in the middle of the gym and he's crying. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, it's not, and he's a big dude. He's like, it's not socially acceptable for this to happen. No, I know. And he's, you know, he works with groups of people and he like shows up and he's all a mess. And like, I just, I so feel like, I know there's part of me where I'm just like, well, welcome. Welcome to what yeah. being a woman is like. You're... I mean, like pick, pick a public place. I've cried there. <laughs> But the difference is nobody gives a shit when I'm Yeah, doing they're just it. like, oh, and she's, you know. Yeah, so I do think that there is a level where it, it, it screws with your emotions so much. And I and I imagine that for, mm -hmm. you know, already sensitive men, that, that is a, a, a tricky thing. And society's not set up to support them in that. Yeah. Uh, but so I think it is really important to just bring yeah. that up. Because I, I it's so funny. We want men to, like, not act like men, which is funny to me. Yeah, um, I agree but then somehow we don't want to support them when they're feeling emotional. Mm -hmm. So it's like, make up your mind, you know? Like, right. So I just want to, I wanted to bring that up. And, and um, this is important because given the numbers, there are so many people that mm -hmm. take these medications that probably don't need to and will eventually come to a place where they need to transition and get off them. Yeah. Or sometimes people have to come off of them. And there's like, it doesn't matter whether or not you have to, need to, want to there's no go through it yeah like there's plenty of women who reach out to me because they're like well i'm want to get pregnant or i'm or i am pregnant Oof, yeah. and then they're in withdrawal and they're pregnant 
and then they're in bad withdrawal. Like it's just this is all when, fairly avoidable. Which oh, is and so then frustrating. You think about like what you go through when you're pregnant, and you think, I wonder how. Like, and then you're. I have three daughters, <laughs> and then like you one of your teenagers will come through and act a certain way and you'll be like i wonder what i was doing in my pregnancy <laughs> right. if they acted like that right was that piece of bologna yeah was that that thing um laird and i actually almost got divorced not a divorce we went through a very weird time um well my last pregnancy and my daughter was pretty spicy and i go oh, i wonder if it's that <laughs> i wonder why we sell ourselves that we're supposed to be happy I feel like if they told us hey it's going to be there's going to be windows and waves of natural mm -hmm, of life, life and we just need to develop the tools and but when it when it becomes one of the waves we don't if if we're not actually like clinically you know kind of having a real chemical issue mm -hmm. um which can't be measured so we never know right we're so afraid of it yeah and um the discomfort and i really think the practice like you said getting those tools really it gets easier but that doesn't mean like i can tell you how many times i ruminate in the middle of the night yeah. at two or three and i know i go oh this isn't doing any good it's not changing i know all the answers and it's still just part of being a human mm -hmm. and so you yeah. know sometimes it's almost inviting in and saying oh there you are can i deal with you tomorrow yeah. i'll take a few deep breaths and go back to sleep yeah. so the book is may cause side effects and will you just remind people all the places mm -hmm. they can find you yes yeah, so the book is may cause side effects it's available wherever books are sold did you read it as well I didn't, and I, I don't know if I... I, I know it's workbooky. Also, those certain books, most yeah. of the books that come on the show are workbooky. They, you go back to them, you reference them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Them. you can go back to my for sure. Right, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Eventually, maybe you might want to. Oh, you mean read it, like go back and read it? No, no, sorry. Did oh. you do an Audible? There is an audiobook. Okay, but, good. But we hired oh, a... Oh, come on. You got well, someone else? No, but there, there's a reason for this. The reason one is, is that, first of all, I sort of figured they're professional voice actors for a reason, and I am not one. The second thing is, is there's a lot of like accents in the book, and I wasn't at the time really prepared to put myself into a position where I did a bad Malaysian accent and a bad Cockney accent. Like, I just didn't know what to do, and so we hired a professional. I probably wouldn't do that again, because I, I do, people do bitch and moan about me not having read it, and I was just like, I don't know. You can always do a different edition of it. I could do that. Yeah. It's a good idea. And then remind them all the places yes. they can find you. Uh, you can find me all over the internet at Brooke Seem, B-R-O-O-K-E-S-I-E-M. And I have a, a newsletter called Happiness is a Skill, but it's just brookseem.substack.com. And I, I've been getting a lot nerdier on that lately with the, the history of psychiatry and how food interacts with all this stuff. And that's where we go there. Okay, last one. Do you have any favorite food hacks? And do you take any extra supplements? Do you think that really help you in this kind of quest for homeostasis? Besides supposedly non-psychedelic mushrooms, yes. So actually, go, there's bro. no psilocybin. Sure. There's no First time, okay. <laughs> oh, That'd be, that's to be something one of my teenagers, what? It's what? true. It's more of a fun, you know the functional <laughs> mushrooms. I'm They're just all kidding. over layered stuff. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I see the layered superfood. I'm just kidding. Right there. Really help me. Um, but uh, uh, okay. as far as food goes, I mean, for me, honestly, just the rule is no no food in packages. Like, yeah. if yep. you want to fix anything, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. um, and I pretty much just eat meat, fruit, fermented dairy, some nuts, chocolate every once in a while. It's kind of it works well seems good yeah uh do you supplement do you feel oh, good do you have certain supplements that really boost you you personally you're not prescribing don't worry no i've been taking i've had since the knee surgery i've added in it's like some collagen which i don't know if that does anything and i take desiccated liver because i don't i'll mix the liver in sometimes but i don't prefer to just eat it like straight um I've been experimenting with methylene blue only because I think it might be the only supplement that, I mean, I'm not recommending anything because I'm not a doctor, but it's the only thing where I look at that and I'm like, this may actually help people in withdrawal. And I would love for someone to do some research on it because again, when I'm the friend I've been working with, he's been screwing around with it. And I said, okay, yeah. well, I'll try it. Well, before but, you go in the sun, you know, yeah. take it. Yeah. Like just even a few minutes before. You don't take it before you go No, inside. take it. Oh, right before. Yeah, it helps it you uptake mm -hmm. everything. That's yeah. what I thought, yeah. But I, 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 I feel like I don't get a ton of 
I don't notice supplements helping me. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because everything else is dialed in. Yeah. So it's just kind of making up. If there's a small gap to make up, it makes it up. But I mostly take stuff just because I'm like, I guess I should. And then I don't even know if that's right. I feel that way too. Yeah. yeah. We have all the answers and you're like, yeah, mm-hmm, sure. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Could change tomorrow. It can. I really appreciate you, uh, your honesty, your transparency. And I know it's easy for me because I didn't go through the journey. But I think you're doing it not only with grace, but the fact that you are producing something so positive out of it. Um, I think that, that that's what we're doing down here. Yeah. It's the only way forward as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So thanks again for joining me and listening to The Gabby Reese Show. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss a conversation. And if anything showed up today that you find would be helpful to someone you know, pass it along and make sure to share with us what really resonated and stood out for you in this conversation. Thanks again for joining us. Keep going and I'll see you next time.